thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. I haven't done uh, much much talk in Asia about Right to Dream, so I'm I'm very excited to to talk a little bit today. Yeah, it's my honor to have you on my show too. So mm -hmm. I usually interview the like uh, uh, founder of a startup and then fund management company, investment company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but uh, you have a, a compa as compared to them, you have a very unique background and an interesting. I expect uh, I'm looking for the interesting backstory as well. Well, everybody likes to talk about football, so uh, yes. hopefully, your, hopefully your audience will will enjoy it a little bit. Yeah, that that it. I assume that that is uh, football is much easier topic for ordinary people to understand, right? Right, as compared to the business. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the business and football they both you know teach you the principles of life. Um, so it's, it's, it's you know it's all the same. I think in football we've um, there's some pretty crazy principles that only exist in football, but if you if you run it in a in a sensible way, like a business, then uh, you know it can teach you most things you need to learn about life. I think. I totally agree with you. I you what you said reminds me of the movie I watched in the past, Moneyball, right? Is yeah. it Moneyball? Yeah, that that movie is very impressive. It actually make a lot of sense, right? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of investors in football who've you know tried to copy the Moneyball model and bring it into football, and even Billy Bean, um, who's the the star of the movie, is uh, an investor in Barnsley now. So. We um we think that some of the things in Moneyball are important, but um, more importantly, we believe in the soul of the game and how it can teach character and how it can teach you value values and principles and and then you have to combine that with uh, with sensible business strategies. So it's it's the same as business. That's a very true. I totally agree with you. In fact, I already interviewed more than hundred people, founder of the business and the founder of investment company, but. The most common answer is at the end of the day, most important thing is human being. We, we mm. work with the people, right? We cannot yeah. apply the very uh, sophisticated business strategy to everybody, right? So we need to understand human being first. Yeah, and, and I think nothing more than football where you depend on your your human beings to go out on the pitch and and, and perform and, and, and represent the brand and represent the model. and. And also protect the business model by by producing good results. So uh, we're an entirely people focused business from the the nine year olds that come into our academies through to yes you know, our players. But then obviously we have two hundred and forty staff now, and, and uh, none of it can happen without them. Yes. So uh, I quickly look at the profile of the the I mean the organization that. Uh, Right to dream, right? Very, very cool name, in fact. <laughs> very good, nice branding. But uh, or you already studied. I mean, you studied in nineteen ninety nine, already more than twenty years ago. Yeah. So uh, my, so I don't know. So how old are you now? But uh, I assume <laughs> that you're quite young at those days, right? Yeah, I was very young when I went to Ghana. I was nineteen years old, and I wow. was an aspiring, um, aspiring professional football coach. I had a job with. One of the biggest teams in Africa uh, to mm. coach within the first team, but I uh, I quickly saw that while there was some talent in the professional levels in Africa, that the real talent was in the nine and ten year olds, uh, their talent in football, but also their their energy and 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 potential and character to be successful in life more generally, and so I decided to to start an academy uh, at a very young age, as you said. Right, and we've managed to build it up um, over the years to where where it is today. Right, right. I I look at the Wikipedia about the right to dream, and then which it says that basically, uh, you train the small number of boys who are the initially housed your house or your home. Right. Yeah. That's a in very interesting description. Maybe it sounds like a humble, but a very interesting story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do, can you tell us a little bit about how did you come up with that idea a little bit more yeah i mean there was a uh, it's a very sad story there was a um a family who were more or less homeless who lived on my street and i used to uh, every day um contribute by them some food or something and and uh, one day the, the the mother died and these kids were left on the street and so i took them into my house and uh I managed to find homes for, for for three of them, but one of them was a young boy. He was a footballer, 
and he told me, um, Tom, you have to start a team. I want a team and you're a, you're a famous coach in Ghana and we have to start a team. So we started this team in the neighborhood um, with just 16 boys. And I started to coach them when I had spare time and I became connected with the problems and problems of poor education, poor nutrition yes. um, and, and no pathways were there. So I decided with my girlfriend that we should move them into the house and try and, yeah. and start something to have a better impact. And all of those boys were really successful and three played for Ghana yeah. and five became professional footballers and six went to university in America. Mm. So we saw that there was uh, the, the skills and the talent and, and that we could play a part in, in creating the pathways. Yeah, very interesting story. I'm also familiar with that. I'm originally from Korea, but that some of the retired football players, they moved to the frontier market like Africa or the, somewhere in the Southeast Asia. And then in, in the beginning, they volunteer, right? They volunteer to train the youth uh, football player. But the, I mean, common story, they don't have money to the buy the football shoes, even though they are very talented, right? So yeah, that's kind of... Uh, common problem I'm, I'm familiar with. I think it's a problem um, in, in a massive amount of the world, uh, not just yes. in, not just in Africa. Um, Agreed. You know, the, the ability to get a top class education as a footballer um, is really only in a very few countries. And, you know, we have a FIFA law at the moment, which says you can't move countries for football until you're 18 years old. And so really it means that um, a large percentage of the world's uh, footballers can't get a football education until they're 18 and it's too late. Right. So uh, it's, it's, it's something that, that needs to be looked at quite seriously. Right, right. So I mean, when you founded uh, Right to Dream, was it the non-for-profit or that you set up as a kind of a business entity? What, uh, what is that? Yeah, Right to Dream in Ghana is a, is a foundation. So it's, it's always been run as a not-for-profit. And, and, and as you know, we bought a, a club in, in, in Europe, uh, which you can see behind me, yes. um, uh, almost six years ago. And uh, that was held in a, that had to be held in a for-profit structure. But uh, we made, the uh, first thing we did was made a board re resolution that is not for dividend. So all the money that's generated from the club goes back into the operation of the academy here in Denmark. And the operation of the academy in Ghana. So our entire model, and even with our new investors, um, the Mansours who are committed to, uh, to that principle is that everything that is generated goes back into creating opportunities for the next generation coming through. Yeah, that's a very interesting. Uh, my background is finance investment. So when I uh, read the news about the Mansour group from Egypt, that they made a more than 100 million pound, right? investment into the right to dream and then you acquired the couple of like a club in the europe so i came to have initial i mean immediate questions it sounds like this kind of this sounds like a business activity investment activity but what you started in the beginning that sounds very typical for the non-for-profit foundation right yeah and i think uh, you know our motivation our belief is that everyone has the right to dream Yes. And in order to make people's dreams come true, you have to pay for it. And, yeah. you know, we looked at what is the, what are the most sustainable ways of paying for our activities that also don't compromise our values. And actually, you know, some of the not-for-profit dollars can be more compromising because there's been a story in Africa of Africa going to beg the world for money in order to save its children for a long time. And so, if you sit purely in that not-for-profit space, you can also create a narrative which can be negative um, in, in that kind of charity context. So for us, we believe that the best way to be sustainable is to own our own professional teams and to sell our own players and then to decide what we do with the money that we generate. And, you know, we, we feel very comfortable that so long as all that money is reinvested into making the program better, that that's the best way for us to operate rather than relying on CSR budgets or charitable donations, yeah, which yes. you can't predict um, how they might change year after year. Um, yes. Whereas if you own a business, you can, uh, it's still a, a high risk business that we run, but you can be a little bit more um, uh, in control of your own destiny. So we, mm -hmm. we, we like to live like this and have more control rather than relying on how somebody feels as to whether they want to help us or not. Yes.
actually that's one of the, my questions so uh, how does that work how does that i mean your program works uh, uh, i mean from beginning to end for example you trained youth in africa I mean, about the football right you you i don't know how how young they are in average you, you i mean do you recruit scout to someone in the, when they are very young and then in, you, you need to finance operation you need to spend the money to train them and then the, you, you invest in them to to make sure that they grow in terms of talents right and then as you mentioned that they have a job in the in the national league in africa or that they have a job in the as a professional uh, football player in us and europe then they can make money so how does that everything work under within your program so uh, we've we've had various iterations of our business model over the 22 years that we've been operating, and so I'll explain how we we operate today. Um, yep. You know, Right to Dream purchased the club in in Denmark, FC Nordjylland, and uh, a couple of the reasons, if we look at the business model, is that um, FC Nordjylland had a very strong academy, mm -hmm. and so that's produced a lot of players that we've been able to sell and has made the club here profitable. And then we also wanted a platform, you know, the, I think the biggest sale of a player from, from Ghana has been like 1 million euros. And, you know, we recently transferred a, a Ghanaian player from FC Nordjylland uh, for a contract which is worth about 21 million euros. So we, um, we have the ability to put our players from, from Ghana into our team here where the market values are much higher and generate transfer fees, which we can then use to make the academy more sustainable we even have we even have an endowment in in, in our academy which is is uh, almost unheard of and so no player pays anything to come to the academy they come fully residential from the age of 10 we have a cambridge accredited school we've had over 70 of our students go to universities in america which is about 50 million dollars in scholarship value and so uh we decided that the best way to do that was in owning our own club to maximize the transfer market, but also with this incredible story to also attract more brand dollars um, into the story. So Nike and DHL, for example, yes. are very yes. proud partners of ours who, who, who believe in the story and believe in the life transformation that we, we create. So we saw this as a, uh, we saw the club in, in, in Denmark as, as a way to be more effective in the transfer market but also to tell our story in a, in, in a more powerful way. Yes, got you, got you. So it sounds like uh, uh, you are the making use of the like a, a pretty, something is common for the business, but uh, except for that, except that you don't distribute the dividend to the shareholder, just like a foundation, right? Exactly. And that's, that was uh, one of the key principles for Mr. Mansour in investing, you know, he's, he's a, an amazingly successful uh, businessman and entrepreneur yeah. and and getting into getting into right to dream but also getting into football is is not something that you would put into the you know the other portfolio of investments that are you know commercially or orientated this is a project of passion for him this is a project of um giving something back and developing the next the next generation and so um i'm sure if he wanted to to make money he could find better ways to invest the money but this is about making a, a positive contribution to the world through the sport that he loves uh, now i understand uh, because that that was actually another question i want to ask uh, mansuru group is a business group they made investment so i i wanted to ask what is motivation motivation behind that i mean the investment right yeah but i make a lot of sense i mean they cannot just uh, continue to focus on the making money right yeah, for synergy and sustainability, as you mentioned, right? You know, to yeah, and, and, and as I said to you, their um, the 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 great grand the grandfather played in uh, in 1934 for Egypt and was actually an Egyptian goalkeeper who went to play in Scotland, which in 1934 is quite a crazy story. And so, football has been in the blood in the family for uh, for a very long time, and they're very passionate football fans. So they always wanted to get into football, but they felt like the modern way that we see billionaires buying football clubs and then signing strikers for 50 or a hundred million dollars wasn't a reflection of their family values. And so they saw the way that Right Dream interprets football and has developed football to be more in line with 
what they believe in. Mm-hmm. And so we were, you know, we were very fortunate and, and, and happy that they decided that the the position that they take in football is is aligned is is through right to dream and aligned with our values rather than what we see with many billionaires in the European Super League where we can see that football is about uh, greed and money and, and they didn't want their football the, their football investment and their football statement to be about those kinds of values. Got you, got you. And uh, uh, part of the news I read about the investment of Mansur Group into the right to dream, and then you talk about the potential purchase of the British club, right? Mm. So uh, is it ordinary, I mean, the football club, or they, are they focused on the like youth academy, something like that? Yeah, I think that uh, it's becoming um, more and more in focus uh, because uh, sustainability for clubs is a big is a big problem. Mm-hmm. So developing your own players is not an easy thing to do, but it is a sustainable thing to do, as we've proved in FC Norseland and Right to Dream. Mm-hmm. So we have a vision that the the Right to Dream academies will be all over the world, and that they will need um, first teams to come and play for. So. Normally, half of our students go to universities in America, and we have students in the Ivy League and at Stanford University, and then the other half come to play for our professional football clubs. So yep. we see the expansion of academies, and then the and then the expansion of clubs. And actually, in 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 the last six months, we've decided to shift our strategy, and we're looking at um, an investment in uh, in the United States for a right to dream, and then a professional football club. Uh, but but I, I'm sure in future that we'll see academies all over Africa and maybe even in um, maybe even in your part of the world in future. Yes. Yeah. And have haven't you thought about uh, I mean the turning your foundation into business structure, the, for the sustainability and better efficiency, etc. Um, at the moment, we like our structure where our academies are in uh, held in foundation. Mm-hmm. And then our professional football clubs are owned in a in a in a not for not for dividend for profit. Yep. Uh, that structure works well for us. And there's also a number of organisations who like to invest in the educational part of our program. Mm-hmm. Some, you know, we have the only residential girls academy in 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 Africa, uh, Right to Dream in Ghana, and we'll be doing the same in Egypt. And and sometimes there's not for profit dollars that like to invest in our programs as well. Mm-hmm. So it works well for us. I think in America, it's quite common to see a for-profit and a not-for-profit working alongside each other with, yes. with a, quite a similar objective. And so we find that model to be quite effective for us as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you have a youth a football youth academy in Ghana, right? In Ghana and in Denmark, yeah. Uh, Ghana in Denmark. But since you have, I mean, you started a program in the Ghana, haven't you thought about expanding in other part of the Africa? Yeah, we're building in Egypt now. So um, we're making a 30 million euro investment into an academy in Egypt, which uh, I think is going to be one of the most beautiful facilities anywhere in the world. So my yes. whole dream and vision is to replicate the academy in, in, in many other places. But Egypt is a fantastic market. There's 105 million people. Most of them are football crazy. Mohamed Salah has uh, uh, really driven the desire to go and play abroad for young Egyptian players. And obviously it's where, where the Mansours are from. Mm-hmm. So it made sense for us for that to be our third academy. And, and as I mentioned to you, we're exploring the US as, as our fourth academy. But certainly my big vision is, is that one day you can see a right stream academy in many, many countries in the world. Okay, someday, some, someday in Asia as well, right? That would be nice. I mean, we come to Japan, uh, apart from COVID, uh, we go to Japan every year uh, to play uh, tournaments and the, the level of youth football there is some of the best in the world and we haven't been to South Korea yet but but uh, I, I know it and we've played against teams in Europe from South Korea and I think the level is is fantastic so that could yes. be exciting for us in future yes. as well. Got it. So uh, what is the next step on top of your mind for the right to dream and uh, kind of uh, long-term goal? Uh, I think we've talked about it already. You know, the next steps is Right to Dream Egypt, which is under construction now. It will open next year. Mm-hmm. And then step after that will be Right to Dream US uh, with a club and an academy is, is our current thinking. So uh, that's keeping us very busy. Um, and alongside that, we're, we're investing more heavily in, in 
the, the building and communication of our brand. So those are the big three things that we're working on for the next uh, for the next five years. Yes. But the long term vision, as I said to you, is that we believe uh, we believe we should see a right stream academy in in many many countries in the world. We know it's needed in a, in a lot of countries in the world. Yeah, thank you so much for taking time, the, sharing the, your vision and the story and your entrepreneurial journey about the football. You're welcome. It's a it's a privilege for me. Yeah, thank you very much.